Welcome to University of Waterloo's Grade 10 Information Night. It's so exciting to have you here on campus. So welcome. For those who are tuning in virtually as well, welcome online. Thank you for spending your evening with us or your afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, feel free to pop in the chat to let us know where you're tuning in from. But for those who made the trek on campus, it's a pleasure to see you here today. University is really exciting, and I know though it can, for students, feel a touch overwhelming at times, so our goal here tonight is for you folks to leave, whether you're a parent, supporter, student, so on, to feel like you have a little more information. Maybe you have some tips and advice on how you might want to pick a university in the future. Maybe you will learn a little thing about admissions, scholarships. We'll have a great panel on student life as well. But overall, before I get too far ahead of myself, I do want to introduce myself first. So my name is Kristen Lease, and I'm a National Marketing and Recruitment Specialist here at Waterloo. I use she, her pronouns. And I graduated with an honors arts degree, majoring in both anthropology and psychology. One reason I love this job is because I get to connect with people just like you. So I love to talk to parents and supporters and students. Waterloo for me was a really great school because when I was sitting in your shoes, basically in the audience, I honestly didn't really know what I wanted to study. Uh, and so the Honors Arts program was really fantastic because I kind of got to test the waters. I got to feel out, do I want to take legal studies, philosophy? Absolutely not, I was terrible at it. Um, but it kind of gave me an opportunity to feel it out. I do want to point out too that while we're talking about university here, we're gonna talk about university in general. I work for Waterloo, so I'm gonna make references to the University of Waterloo for examples, but just know whether you're looking at Waterloo, McMaster, Guelph, whoever, you can apply these same tips and tricks as you go around. But university is a really exciting time. As I said, it can be a little overwhelming. There can be a touch of nervousness, but I'm hoping tonight by talking through our speakers, our student panel, you can kind of lean into this nervousness and get excited. It can be a really transformative process as well, which I know our keynote speaker will touch on. But the key here is that through experiences, through in-classroom, outside a classroom, you get to really grow and ultimately become the person you want to be as an adult. I always say to my mom, I'm still figuring out what I want to do when I grow up, and so you could very well be in this spot, say, 10 years from now. Now, I do want to take a moment, though, to acknowledge the territories that we work on, because, um, if my mic cuts in and out, there we go. Um, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the territories we live, work, and study on. So the University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee's peoples. Campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, which is, six which is land granted to the Six Nations, about six miles on either side of the Grand River. And we are active towards reconciliation on our campus, whether that's through research, learning, teaching, and so forth. As a non-Indigenous person myself, I am personally committed um, to helping actively go against co colonization, whether that's through taking parts in soup lunches, workshops, and so forth. And I'm able to do this because of the Office of Indigenous Relations. But now, I want to also address, I address the students in this group, I want to address the parents and supporters in this room, because without you folks, our students wouldn't be here. And I don't have children, I have pets, which maybe isn't exactly the same thing as being a parent, but I can only imagine you want what's best for your kids. And when you're trying to anticipate the next milestone, the next big step that's coming for them, there's always like surprises or there's more information or you say, man, I wish I would have known that five years before. So our goal for you as parents and supporters here tonight is for you to also leave feeling that same way of feeling informed and having your questions answered. Now, you're all sitting here, and I know you're thinking this is going to be a long presentation. She's kind of funny, but she's not that funny. And so because of that, I want to play a little game of this or that to kind of just liven it up a bit, get the blood pumping. This is a game I play with my family all the time, can get a little heated. Essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up two pictures, and you have to vote, do, would you go with this one or that one? Now, what makes this game fun is that in your mind, you have to go really high stakes. Like if I put up cats or dogs, you have to say to yourself, I will only ever pick dogs for the rest of my life. And you vote, you can put up your hand, you can make like a little woo noise. You can say, oh yeah, doesn't matter. 
And for those who are particularly vocal, I might toss out some toques or some soft prizes into the crowd. Nothing um, that's going to take your eye out, but just for those who get a little more excited. So let's do a test run. This one I consider pretty easy. So would you rather for the rest of your life only use an Apple phone or an Android? Android. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll be honest, I wasn't expecting such a reaction, so I'm quite pleased to hear that. I think I heard something over here, so Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. <laughs> I'll pass it here and you can give I won't make sure not to do any pens. Okay, so that was pretty good. You understood the assignment. I should have known if you're interested here at Waterloo. The next one. A little generational, I know, I know. Oh, that, in person, who said that? That's a winning vote. I know, I vote in person too, I'm just kidding. Okay, that was good, that was good. So I put this one up here for the reason <laughs> so hear me out. I have that genetic trait that they always talk about where it tastes like soap when you eat cilantro, right? And so I hate it, but when I was young, which arguably is a little bit before you folks here for students, it used to be a threat that when you would swear they would wash your mouth out with soap. I don't know if anyone remembers this. And so I can tell you, because of my own experience, Dove body wash soap tastes better than Irish Spring. And I can tell you cilantro tastes worse than that. So I'm going to toss it. So this is a good one because there's two good options. Orange. Blue. So I live in the pink world. I think pink is great, but really, you can't go wrong. I like this one because on any day, Either of these are a good option. But I saw someone here yelling red. Okay, you're way in the back, so I'm gonna... Oh! <laughs> Come find me after, you can get something too, because I almost hit you in the head. Okay, this last one is a little daunting. And I want you to think about it before you answer, because at my kitchen table with my family, we get a little heated about this one. Is there anyone, I was going to say, is there anyone that says, no, it's the Canadians? It is. No. Yeah? The Leafs will win when the hell throws the trees. Exactly. Here. Oh, sorry. It came right out. Okay. Now I promise. This is actually my last one. I forgot I put this one in here. This is a good one. Just think about it. I just want to say to all the parents that voted animals, I know there's something there about that. You're like, I brought my kid here. They're not as cute as they used to be. It's animals. And so I get that. I get that for sure. I'm going to, well, I can't go up there, but 
I'll give it a toss because I heard some really loud yelling this way. So those folks there, hopefully not hit anybody this time. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you for playing with me. I got one more of those embedded in the presentation, but just a fun way to kind of get active so you don't have to listen to me the whole time. This is just a quick snapshot of what we're doing here this evening. So we're going to have an awesome keynote that's going to speak about university, how to think about it, what your purpose is. We're then going to hear from some good guest speakers in admissions and scholarships and financial aids. They're experts, so any questions you have, we can ask them afterwards. We then are going to have a student panel, because I think it's really important for you students in the room here today to not just listen to me, but to listen to people actually in the process of university. What's it like? Do you have fun? That kind of thing. I do want to plug, if you happen to be here and you said, I actually came here specifically for civil engineering because I want to do an elective in my second year in Spanish and I want to know if I can do it, this presentation is a little more general in nature, like I said. So if you have any specific questions that you know this is my program, you're welcome to ask questions out in our info booth, so where you would have been at the beginning. That booth setup with tables will be open until 8.30, and I'll make sure I get you out of here in time uh, to go there. But just know that you can ask questions there, or you're welcome to come to our March break open house. Registration is live. You just follow the URL. You can even just Google University of Waterloo March break open house. Good way to kind of feel it out, but I just put that up there for you. And now, I'm going to read this beautiful long description of our keynote speaker. Um, I would have memorized it, but it's very robust. So, I would like to welcome to the stage Dr. Christine. So, she is a lecturer in the School of Environment, Resources, and Sustainability at the University of Waterloo, and she also serves as an associate dean teaching for the Faculty of Environment. She teaches undergraduate courses throughout the year, but focuses her time on teaching the spring block field courses within the department. Her approach to teaching is focused on student-centered learning with the goal of promoting curiosity in her students, allowing them to think critically and inspire in innovative solutions to, bless you, to build a better future. Christine is a doctoral fellow from the School of Environment, Resources, and Sustainability at the University of Waterloo, and her research background has focused on the social and ecological challenges and opportunities of climate change for First Nations living in the Canadian subarctic. She has researched the opportunity of using agroforestry systems to promote ecologically and socially sustainable local food systems in the First Nation communities in subarctic Ontario. Further, Christine's research has contributed to the development of a web-based informatics tool that can help reduce challenges associated with bush travel in the subarctic due to rapidly changing climactic conditions. <laughs> Woo! Welcome, Christine. Okay. One slide. Is my mic on? No. Which is perfect, actually, because I never... never... Oh! I never use a microphone, so now I have to speak a little quieter. I tend to get excited and get louder and louder, and then those around me tell me to shh, which puts me on another level, because I don't like that. So anyways, um, that was a, a long and kind of wordy um, introduction, but thank you. Uh, and I'm going to get to, when I start my presentation, about really my passion and why I'm here and why I said that I would come today and talk to you about knowing your why. So you're on this journey, you're beginning this exciting path, um, trying to figure out what are you gonna do in university? There's endless possibilities, and if you're like me, I can get interested in anything. So you're probably hearing from friends around you, you know, parents and support people who are trying to guide you in what they think or maybe feel is a right direction. Maybe there's career paths that they want you to explore. But what I want you to do and to think about as you're moving along on this path is about knowing your why. This is a great opportunity before you enter the university setting to understand your why and the power behind your why. How many of you have heard of the idea of knowing your why? Just put your hand up if you have. Okay, a couple of you. And then those that have put your hand up, how many of you, if I asked you right now, what is your why, whether around career or um, hobbies? Does anyone know their why? 
Money, that definitely. I said that to my husband because he's not quite happy at work. And I said, you know what? Your family is your why right now. So it changes. Um, so if you haven't heard of your why, that's okay. I didn't really fully understand it until I heard the term applied to my feelings about my education and my job and my research. So if you don't know it, but you feel that those around you maybe have it all figured out, that's okay. You'll follow that journey. You'll get there at your own pace. But the powerful understanding of why is so important. So really, the idea of why is about emphasizing the importance of understanding those underlying reasons, the motivations or purposes behind any of the goals, the decisions that you make. They help guide you, move you forward. It gives you a sense of purpose as to what you're doing, any of your goals, the decisions that you're making, and especially when it comes to university, it's about the decisions you're making about what are you going to study. There's so many opportunities. But knowing some purpose, your motivation, this is what will help you with those decisions. Your university journey is not just about what you study. It really isn't. It's an add-on. It gets you to a career path. But really, it's about understanding who you are and who you're going to become. It's a journey. So how do you find your why? What can you do? It seems like this big you know, term that's oh, it's different things to different people. But there are some steps that you can do to help you understand what your why is. And start with, generally, some personal reflection on your goals, your interests, your values. Think about those. What is important to you? There's some questions here that generally I advise my students to ask yourself. What drives you? What propels you forward? What makes you get up in the morning and get excited? And you know what? Sometimes you don't have drive. That's OK. But on a day-to-day, -day, oh, year over year, what is that keeps you going? What are you passionate about? Passion is another level of just being excited or being interested in something. Passion makes you do more, makes you better. What impact do you want to make in the world? And this is something that, this is one of the questions that really drives my why. What do you want to change? Is there something that you have seen that you're angry about, that isn't fair, that you want to change? These questions help you. What ignites that spark within? You know, that burning fire that keeps you going, kind of that glow within you. Your journey is not just about earning a degree. It really isn't. It's about aligning your choices with your values, really creating a path that resonates with who you are at your core. Your finding your passion will equal motivation, and motivation will help you forward along your whole university career and further into adulthood. So I wanted to share my why. And it hasn't been a clear path of you know, progressing through undergrad and then knowing exactly what I wanted to do. It was far from that. My undergrad degree was in biology. So when I was in high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. But what I did know is that I loved the environment. I love nature. I loved being outside. So that was, at the time, my why, my passion. So I took a biology degree. Um, there were some failures, some first-year calculus courses that I had to retake a few times. But it's OK, because I loved biology, and I loved what I was doing. So I kept going. I enjoyed exploring different classes. I took a Greek and Roman civilization and history of popular music. I loved it because I was passionate. But as I got to my fourth year, I realized that uh, my why was a little faded, not so clear. I was a little concerned what I was going to do after my undergrad. And I also had learned a lot about the state of our environment. 
I realized that our problems were so big. And my skill set, I had learned a lot, but it was really on biological systems. Social systems wasn't part of it, and so I realized that we really needed to talk to people, get them in the room to make a difference. So that led to opening doors to my why for my grad studies. I looked at social systems, I talked to people, I tried to make a difference. It was great. Master's, PhD, I enjoyed it, but as I started to get to the end of my PhD, again, I got to this kind of murky spot of what am I going to do? It doesn't really seem so passionate. My purpose isn't really there. That is when, as I was TAing, I had my professor at the time that was teaching the course asked me if I would teach a first-year stats course. Scared me. Did not want to do that. Did not want to teach this course. It was terrifying. I didn't think I could do it. But this is one piece of advice. I knew, although it felt really uncomfortable and my first instinct was no, I knew it was going to be good for me. So taking that chance kind of made a curveball in my, my path, my why, and it opened the door to teaching. I taught that course and I realized that my passion for making a difference was in my students. If I could go into classes and inspire students, inspire their whys, allow them to achieve their whys, then that was mine. So that was my why. And that is why I decided to be a teaching professor, that I was going to be here, and I can inspire students and see their passion. So that's how I ended up where I am today. My why changes sometimes in the sense of, you know, there's different paths, and, but every year when I come back to my first year class and I see their excitement and their want to make a difference, that flame burns. So, speaking of my first year class, I wanted to share some of this. This was, so in my first class in the fall, I do this whole why discussion, not as in-depth as this one, but I talk to the students about why they're there. So I'm in the School of Environment, Resources, and Sustainability, and I ask them to give me this word cloud of their purpose, their why. Why are they here? And so I wanted to share some of them, and you can see, just by looking at some of these responses, that students are on different paths. They don't have it figured out in their first year by any means. There are some students that talk about passion and wanting to make a difference. Then there are some students that are taking the course or maybe in the program are doing it because of different aspects of it. So there's a co-op. In my program, you don't need hard math or chemistry. So some of these things are helping them. There's also bread on there. So maybe people are really passionate about bread, and I get that. Um, or they didn't spell broad right, and maybe bread <laughs> came out. But it was just an interesting thing to show you about the different stages. Even though people have decided on a program and they've shown up first day, they're at different stages. And that leads into how finding your why is a journey. It's a journey. It's a different journey for everyone. Some people have a faster journey. Maybe some have more road roadblocks or speed bumps, I guess, in the way. But it's OK if it takes time. It will. And don't worry if those around you seem like they have it figured out. It's OK. It's personal. Stay curious. This is the time to ask questions. Take those random Greek and Roman civilization courses. Explore. Open your door, your why door. It might open opportunities that you didn't know existed or jobs that you had no idea about. Stay open-minded. You're going to meet professors with a broad background. You're going to meet classmates that have varied lived experiences and come with such a unique perspective. Allow that to challenge your beliefs. Allow that information in. It's going to make you better off. It's going to allow your why to grow. 
be patient. Be patient. Give yourself space and time, and if it doesn't happen right away, it will. Just keep the doors open. Embrace challenges. We're going to have challenges. There's going to be times when you get a mark back that you didn't expect, or there's going to be a whole bunch of due dates on the same day, and you just, you're going to feel challenges. But remember, if you know your why and your purpose, those challenges will be opportunities. You'll have that guiding light to keep you going and moving forward. So, in conclusion, I want you to try to remember this if you can, but really that your journey's beginning now. Make it meaningful, make it purposeful, and really make it uniquely yours. This is your journey. Go discover your whys. Thank you. Well done. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Christine. I think that's a really good message because so much of university, like so much of it happens outside of the classroom is when you do really get to grow. Um, and I think that's something just important to remember for all of us. I also have never felt so much more related to when someone put bread. Um, I completely agree, bread is my why too. So uh, next up, we're gonna give you a little bit of advice, like I said, about how you might wanna go about picking a university in the future. And again, this can be for Waterloo, this can be for Laurier, McMaster, Toronto, wherever you want. This is just basically a way to get the conversation started. So if you show up to a school visit or you're talking to someone like me and you're not sure what to ask, this is supposed to help you kind of, you know, down that path. Likely when you came in to this uh, auditorium, you received one of these. This is just a conversa conversation starter card. Um, you're welcome to use it. It's just a reminder of what we're going to talk about here. But we're going to go over an acronym called PLACES. We're going to talk about programs, location, and so on. Again, this is just an idea. You're sitting here in grade 10. Some of you, no doubt, from like grade five, you woke up, you're like, I'm gonna be an architect, I know what I'm gonna do. And then other people maybe got dragged here by their parents and both of those are right. Neither one is in an, in, like better than the other. As I said, I was the person that like in grade 12, I was like, oh my God, applications open next week? I didn't realize. And then I did a fifth year, but you don't have to. If you know what you wanna do, if you came out of the womb and you said it's gonna be engineering, it's gonna be engineering, I'm happy for you. So the first one, first letter for programs, or for places as programs. If you're curious about what Waterloo has to offer, um, you can pick up one of these nice little black view books. This is a nice summary. We offer programs, admissions, everything that we're gonna touch on. But the key here with programs is, um, I always say start by thinking, what do I enjoy in high school? Like what are the subjects that I, you know, don't try to skip regularly? Is it English? Is it sciences? Is it math? Whatever. That can give you an idea of where you might want to start looking. But I will point out that the cool thing about universities is they offer so many unique programs outside of those subject matters. So absolutely, we offer degrees in biology, chemistry, English. But then you, uh, universities will offer really unique programs. So a cool example I always cite is knowledge integration. It's in the Faculty of Environment. It's a program for students who just literally love learning and they can't pick what they want to do. We also offer things like geological engineering, which I always think is cool, become a geologist and an engineer. But the point is, is there's so much beyond what you might be exposed to. So as I said, at the University of Waterloo, we actually have a plethora of programs. This is me using Waterloo as an example here. So we have over 100 different programs from everything from your arts, sciences, environment, engineering, health, math, and so on. And like I said, if you already are standing up or you're already listening to me stand up here and say, Kristen, I don't care. I already know what I want to study. Well done. You're doing better than I was. But the key here is to not write anything off and just think about what you might want to enjoy. I would then say, if you figure out what you want to study and you have an idea maybe of what school, you can start to look into things like what makes that program unique. So what makes it stand out? Am I able to do international exchanges, for example, if I come into this program? Or are there hands-on experience opportunities, whether it's like a really cool lab, so our kinesiology students dissect human cadavers in their first year. That's always one I share that's pretty unique. 
But are there opportunities like that? Or are there work experiences as well? At Waterloo, for us, I always say one thing that students come to us for is co-op. So co-op is paid hands-on job experience, and it can be applied almost across every program, not quite everyone, but almost everyone across all six faculties. And again, this is paid hands-on job experience broken up into like these four or eight-month chunks in your undergrad. Now, how exactly it works, when it starts, when do I get a job and all that, you don't necessarily have to know at this point as, as you're in grade 10, but certainly you're welcome to chat with people outside in the information booth to feel it out. The key here is that you get to test drive different careers. You get to figure out what you like, but also what you don't like. It's not uncommon for students to be in co-op, test out that career that they've been circling for the rest of their childhood, and then say, I absolutely hate it. So it's something to consider. But now you've figured out, okay, I kind of get what I want to study. Maybe it's in the arts. The next thing I want to figure out is where do I want to do that? So this can mean distance from home. If you're local from here, maybe you want to stay within the Kitchener-Waterloo-Guelph region. Maybe you're like, I love my mom and dad, but I'm so sick of them. I want to go way up north. Totally understandable. Or I want to go to Kingston or whatever. This also applies to thinking about, say, the school itself. So like the size of it. Do I want to be in a smaller campus, like say Algoma? Do I want to be in a huge campus like U of T? Also, yeah, absolutely, go Algoma. Um, but also, do I potentially want to be in like a campus that's say in a downtown core, or do I want to be in an enclosed campus? So like Waterloo is an enclosed campus, everything's within Ring Road. I came from a small town, so for me, the idea of like being in downtown Toronto was so overwhelming, but it could totally fit you. So something to think about when I figured out what I want to study, I have an idea of where I kind of want to study it, the next logical question might be, well, what do I need to get into it? So with that in mind, I'm going to bring up Andre Jardin. Um, for those who don't know Andre, he's a pretty uh, celebrity here for Waterloo, a pretty public face. He's the associate director or the associate registrar of admissions at Waterloo, and his main goal is to always admit the students that fit Waterloo in the student-friendly manner. If you see Andre here and you think, oh my gosh, he's really scary, he's in this black suit, I just want you to know that Andre has three miniature goats. And I share that because you can only be so afraid of someone with miniature goats. So, without further ado, we'll pass it to Andre. I had to work the goats in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're good. This is actually one of my favorite events to participate in. I've been doing admissions and recruitment for almost two decades, and what I love about this night is the energy, but also the chance to give you some really good fundamental information, dispel some of the myths, and just answer your questions. So we'll have a Q&A on stage. I'll also be here with members of our team and lots of people from the faculties to answer questions after. Um, I'm very fortunate to work at the place I graduated from. Like many of you in the room, I had no idea what I was gonna do when I was done. I actually thought I was gonna go into foreign affairs. I took a year off to travel, loved it. And then a professor said, I think you'd be a good recruiter. Why don't you try this for four months? And I've never left. And it's been great work. I get to meet amazing people like yourself. And I put my rhetoric and professional writing uh, degree to good use every day. You might have seen an article in the Star today. I, mean, I can answer your questions later. Uh, so again, we are very lucky to have a great team here, and I'm going to uh, tell you some of the basics, but I can tell you right off the bat that if you call us, we will answer the phone, we will answer your emails, whether you're doing that right now in grade 10, or you're in that final push uh, before the final round in grade 12. So um, we have a great team, and we're here to help. So how does admissions work? There's a lot of myths out there. And a lot of, um, I think, perception that it's a really convoluted or tricky process. The reality is that as a public institution, we have a number of domestic students, so Canadian citizens, permanent residents, that the government sets for us. So we have a specific number of students that we take in at Waterloo. It's over 80% of our target is Canadian students. So that's one number for you. So if you're in this room and you're a Canadian student, you're competing against other Canadians for those domestic spots. And we have a target for every single program. We also have an international target. So for us, that's about 18 to 20% of our enrollment, and international students are competing for those spots. So you put the two numbers together, and you have our enrollment for the year. 
and we have incredible retention. It's over 90%. So the students that start with us generally will graduate from Waterloo and go on to great things. So we try to look after you from day one until you become an alumnus. So those are the numbers, and that's what drives how we make admissions decisions. So what makes a program competitive versus non-competitive? One is just how many spots we have, and the second is societal interest, and that changes pretty dramatically. So I'm gonna give you a tangible example. Uh, at the start, as COVID really rolled out, there were a lot of adults in the health professions that were really stressed out for good reasons, and some were leaving. But what we actually saw was, as adults were questioning a lot of the uh, areas connected to health, in some cases, students and young people were really resonating with, this is a great area to help people. It's meaningful, there's a future here. And so we saw 168% increase in applications to health sciences, and it stayed at a really high level. So that changed, or changed our admissions requirements. Not the courses, but just where our cutoffs were. So same courses, same program, same great professors, but all of a sudden the cutoffs went up over 10%. So the decisions that we make are based on the data and every class every year. So the requirements today will not be the same requirements most likely when you apply. So I just want to make that clear. It's about space and competition. And the really competitive programs, again, that are highly ranked, those are the areas where you're gonna have lots of applicants, really strong applicants, and again, you're competing against similar students, so we have to make decisions. So that's how it works. It's really data-driven. And programs range dramatically. So we start around the 80% range for many of our programs at Waterloo, right up until the one that's in the news is computer science. We have one of the top-ranked programs in the world, one of the largest intakes in the world for computer science. But there's so much interest in it that you need to be up in the high 90s. We start kind of at the mid-90s. And again, that's societal interest. In my career, we're admitting in the mid-80s. So that's how it works. It's, it's based on the demand. So what do you need to get ready for that? So you're probably already thinking about what courses you want to take. So in most high schools in Ontario, you're looking at U or M level courses. Those are the courses that are eligible to be considered when we calculate an average. So there are C courses as well. C courses are specifically for the college level. They are not eligible for admission requirements at most universities. Some perhaps, but for us it's U and M level courses. So it kind of speaks to the finding your why and finding your passion. When you're thinking about what you want to study, you also want to think about what am I going to be successful in? So of course not every subject is going to be uh, your favorite subject or something that comes naturally. But if you want to open the doors to the most programs and universities possible, look at taking a good range of courses, give yourself options, and that also speaks to, we'll get to calculating an average, but we do an average on best six. If you only take six courses, that means you're counting on getting at least a passing grade and good grades in those six courses, and that's going to be your average. If you take an extra course, you're giving yourself a freebie, right? We'll, sub we'll take your next best course for your, your extra course beyond the requirements. So just think about that. You want to find balance. I'm not encouraging you to maximize and take a crazy amount of courses, but I want to make sure that there's no one in this room, like some of my family members, I'm a director of admissions, but I have nieces and nephews who I've had to counsel saying, so you're taking six courses and you're failing one. You realize if you fail that course, you won't have an average and you won't get in university. Why don't you get out of that course and take this other course. And they change that and they open those doors. So it does matter right now what you pick, but just, again, mix that, finding the things you're passionate about and do your research to find out which courses you have to have. So engineering has the most requirements, two math courses, chemistry, uh, physics, and English. There's an example, whereas other subjects or other programs might just have one required course. So what are the requirements? As I said, we start around 80%. We'll take your best six courses if you're in Ontario, and that includes your required courses. So that's literally how we calculate your average. And for arts, environment, science, and health, that is your basis for admission. So if you meet our minimum criteria, so when we draw the line, if you're above the line, you'll get an offer. And what determines that line is another great question. It's actually a little bit of just mathematics. We have what's called show ratios. So we analyze the data from the previous three years, and it tells us what the likelihood is of someone coming. So it's not about you as a person, it's just a mathematical calculation, but say for health sciences, it might say that to get 100 uh, students, 
we need to make 400 offers. So at 400, we draw the line. And each program has different ratios. So that's why you can't just predict that and you can't just say an exact average for competitive programs because we don't know where it's gonna land until we're actually doing the assessment for that admission cycle, okay? So admission requirements are the best six or equivalent. We have people uh, in the room, I'm sure, from um, different systems of study. Our team looks at over 100 different systems of study from all over the world, and our job is to do the equivalencies. So it doesn't matter if you're out of province or in another part of the world, we are gonna calculate an average using the same equivalent courses, so that's apples to apples. Everybody's getting a fair assessment. So beyond grades, so I said grades is the basis for many of our courses. The more competitive an area, the more applications we have, the more need there is to distinguish between a lot of students that have the same average. So in computer science, 1% could make a difference of hundreds of students. So you can't just do it on average, and they're all great students. So that's where we add an additional layer. So it might be our supplementary form, we call it the admission information form, series of questions that you answer. It could be a video interview. If you're going into architecture, there's a portfolio and a pricey. So where you have those extra layers, it will be well advertised. The expectations are there. What we don't tell you is exactly how we score them. That's the magic question. It's kind of like giving you the answers to the test. We don't want you to answer the way you think you should answer. We're trying to answer, uh, ask you transparent questions so that we can get a better sense of who you are. And again, those things get assessed, scored, and that gets added to your average. So your average is always really the main important part, and then we supplement that with other things, hence the supplementary pieces. So it is a fairly straightforward process. The other thing is that you know how you're doing, and your friends might share with you what they think we assess them based on, but they don't necessarily know everybody else. So keep in mind, it's only as good as knowing the whole applicant pool. So you might have a 95 average and not get into computer science, but remember that there's a whole range of thousands of students applying from all over the world that are also in that range, and we're scoring those other things as well. So they're all really good academically. It's those subtle things that make the difference. So we'll try and answer your questions throughout the admissions process and make sure that you know what to expect, but honestly, just be authentic, answer the questions. Generally, for any of those things, the questions are even known ahead of time, and we'll see how the world changes too, because now we've got chat GPT and lots of other things to think about. Um, and our goal in admissions is to remain transparent, but also to try and get your most authentic self applying, because that's what makes for good students coming in and also high graduation rates, because ultimately we want you to be successful. That's what admissions is about. It's not to keep people out, it's actually to get people in. So applying to Waterloo. Historically, we're very lucky. We have almost half of the universities in Ontario. So this really is, as Christian said, it's like a soft sell. It's not Waterloo at all costs. We want you to go out. Do your research, ask lots of questions, apply to multiple universities, and then hopefully one day you'll have a whole range of offers in front of you, some scholarships, some bursaries, and you can make the decision that is best for you. But when you are looking at applying to Waterloo, you'll actually get three choices for your basic application in Ontario. So it could be three choices at Waterloo. Maybe you can't make up your mind. You've got engineering, you've got science, you've got arts, or it could be three different universities. And if you want to cast the net wider, you can pay, I think it's $50 for additional choice, and away you go. You can apply to 15 places if you don't mind spending a little bit of extra money. But you get three choices. Every single application will get a decision, hopefully all positive decisions. And then you can look at, like I said, all of the different options. But you will get those three choices and you'll have a, a confirmation deadline. Usually it's June 1st, June 3rd, in around there. So we make sure that essentially you've got all the offers out to you before we really want you to make that decision. And that's through the Ontario University Application Center. Your guidance counselors are gonna work with you. They wanna make sure that you don't forget to apply. Um, I think mom and dad will also be bugging you a little bit about that too. And then once you have applied, we're gonna communicate with you regularly, whether it's through email, good old fashioned email, social media, events like this. We're gonna make sure that you know what you need to do, next steps, and guide you through that journey. And then we hope that after you get an offer, you can come and do even more research, talk to great professors like you heard tonight, find out more about the area that you're excited about, and then make a really well-informed choice. So, I will stop there, and I'm sure there'll be lots of detailed questions later. Well done, thank you. See, Andre's not so scary, thank you.
Just an aside, I used to work in admissions before I was in this job, and I want to point out that um, when you apply, we could see your email that you apply with. Um, and so sometimes students make their own emails and whatever, I love it. Um, but I still remember some that I used to see in admissions. So Sandy Cheeks 2023, I still remember. I hope you got an offer. But you know, just think about it. Maybe you want to update your email, big hottie, whatever it was, doesn't matter. Next up, so we've talked about, I know my programs, I kind of have a feeling where I want to go and I know what I, admissions wise, what I need. The next big question is cost. And so absolutely, university is an investment, but don't you worry, we have an expert here this evening, um, Maureen Jones, I'm gonna invite up here. She has actually been the, she's the Director of Student Award and Financial Aid, the office on our uh, campus here. She's been at the university for over 20 years in this office and she's a graduate. Um, and there's no one that knows more about what she's gonna share than Maureen herself. So welcome Maureen. Thank you so much. I have my glasses, I have my water, I am all set. <laughs> I'll speak for the next hour, maybe hour and a half. It'll be fine, it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. All right, thank you for the nice introduction. I actually was a student here as well in the English department at the University of Waterloo. My was the first co-op job was working in the registrar's office at the University of Waterloo on publications and the big calendars we used to produce. So it's been a number of years since I have done that, but uh, this was my home and my passion. So I want to talk today about costs and financing, and I'm going to be giving you some examples about what it costs at the University of Waterloo, but I'm also going to give you some idea of what you can expect when you do your research and ask questions about what the school you may be interested in is offering, what's available to you. Oops, did I say down? Am I upside down? Oh, there it is. Hang on. Oh, there we go. Okay, so there's a lot of information on this slide, but I just want to talk a little bit about some of the pieces. We've tried to put all kinds of numbers on this slide. So the first piece up there under tuition and scholarships is the actual scholarship area, which is entrance scholarships for the University of Waterloo. There are general scholarships, what we call grid scholarships, which are based on your grades. And that's where the merit scholarship, the president scholarship, and the president scholarship of distinction all come in based on your admission average to the University of Waterloo. Then we have entrance bursaries as well. And the value of this is anywhere between $1,000 and $5,000 for an entrance bursary paid over the two terms in your first year. And I'll go into more detail on the scholarships and the bursaries, but just to know that there are things that you should be looking for right at the beginning. What can I apply for? What is automatic consideration? We've given an idea of what the first year tuition Maybe, and that varies by program. So arts, science, environment, um, mathematics in some areas, maybe on the lower end, engineering, computer science on the higher end. And these costs are based on eight months worth of study or two terms. Over on the right-hand side, we've tried to summarize for you the living expenses that you may have to, you would incur when you were here, trying to break it down between residents whether you're in a shared accommodation or in a single room, we have suite style apartments as well, multiple bedrooms with a living room, etc. So there's lots of options. If you're in a suite style residence, you're not having to pay for a meal plan, but you do have a kitchen and you do have the opportunity to make your own meals, etc. That's the one piece of advice I can give you now is this weekend, I want you to go home and cook a meal for mom and dad. I want you to learn how to cook because it's gonna keep you in good stead when you, uh, if you're in one of those uh, particular options. Your meal plan will be in what we call the traditional style residence. So you've got a shared room and it's uh, rooms down a hall, there's a cafeteria, there's otherwise um, general living areas as well, general study spaces. In those traditional residences, you would be required a meal plan and they have a variety of meal plans from light to medium to hearty. 
So that's something you need to add in there. There'll be your personal expenses, which would be um, your internet, your phone, laundry, travel, et cetera. You've got to factor that in. And then your books and supplies. And they are going to range as well, depending on your program. So you start adding up all of those pieces, and you realize that this is a fairly significant investment, and this is just first year. So you've got to keep all of that in mind. One of the things that's really great from a Waterloo perspective is our co-op program, that opportunity for you to be in a program that does alternate your schoolwork with work terms, and so you're able to earn in between those school terms and save some money towards the expenses for the next term. And the co-op um, salaries will vary as well, depending on first year, second, third, or fourth year. So you can see there's a range somewhat in there. Just to give you an idea, 90% of the students that applied for admission to the University of Waterloo last year, 90% of those students did receive an entrance bursary or scholarship to attend the University of Waterloo. So I just want to itemize here for you the resources that you should be keeping in mind when you're planning to attend a post-secondary institution. So talk to your parents. They may have put money aside. They may have put money into RESPs, the Registered Education Savings Plan. Those are things you're going to want to tap into. If you have a part-time job, you're going to want to put some of that aside as your savings to help cover these costs. So one of the things we may recommend is if you've got a job, you take your resulting pay and you say, okay, one third of that is savings, one third of it is this, and one third I can have fun with. But just making an effort to make sure that you're putting some aside for these expenses. You can take a look at scholarships and awards, and each institution will offer a variety of different scholarships and awards right at the beginning and then possibly throughout your academic career. Scholarships, if I use the definition, that's where it's based on grades. If we're talking bursaries, it's based on financial need. So in a lot of cases, scholarships may be automatic consideration. Bursaries, you may need to apply for because we require more information than just the grades. Uh, Co-op earnings, I've mentioned that before. OSAP, which is the Ontario Student Assistance Program, is the government program to help with costs for post-secondary. It's a mixture of grants and loans that you should take a look at and see whether you qualify for. I, wouldn't, I would say that you, I would encourage you to apply for OSAP assistance because you don't know. And even three years from now, things are going to change with this program. So I encourage you to apply because it does give us the basis for financial need, which is consistent across the board. You may find with your program that you're able to take on a part-time job, and there are a number of those available on campus through our work-study program. And what's nice about some on-campus jobs is they have a complete understanding of what it's like to be a student and being able to accommodate, possibly in some cases, your ability to do this part-time job. And it does help with some funds month to month to month. Student line of credit. This may be something that you want to explore. Talk to mom and dad, talk to your bank. This is sometimes a recommendation from us to say, see whether you qualify, and it's keep it in your back pocket. It's something that you may want to take a look at. You may not want to take a whole lot of it out. Sometimes it helps to bridge between a school term and a work term with some of the costs that you have. But it's money management. You've got to make sure that you're keeping that information and keeping on top of a line of credit. And for those of you that don't know, higher ed points is something that you can use if you have a lot of aeroplan points or a lot of TD travel rewards points. There is a company called higher ed points where you can log in, transfer in your points, and they transfer money to the institution of your choice to pay some of your fees. So if you've got grandma or grandpa that are accumulating all of those points, that may be one way that you can help towards payment of your um, university education. It also is an option if you are um, repaying student loans. You can also trade in your Aeroplan points towards paying your loans at the end of your um, undergraduate career, or your, your uh, post-secondary career. 
So talking about scholarships, as I said, based on grades, for the most part at Waterloo, it is automatic consideration for the entrance scholarships. As I mentioned before, we have our grid scholarship, and then there are quite a number that are faculty-based. There will be some specifics, faculty of mathematics, for example, that will have an application form. So again, when you found your program, you found your location, then take a look at the specifics for the particular program from an entrance perspective. Some of these scholarships may be more than just grades. So that's where we take a look at uh, Andre's slide, beyond grades. What have you uh, participated in from an extracurricular, volunteer? The faculties especially use the information on the applicant information form to help with their scholarship decisions. I've listed a website for Waterloo to have you get an idea of the type of scholarships we have available on an entrance basis and what is required. These scholarships are available to both domestic and international students, so you can take a look at that on our website. And we have a database on the Student Awards and Financial Aid Office website. We actually have two, one for entrance and one for first year and above. So you can go in and you can choose your program or your interest and say, I'd like to be considered for an entrance scholarship. What do I have to do? And that database is going to give you information back on that. When it comes to bursaries, we've talked about that, it's based on financial need. It's like a grant, you don't have to pay back the bursary, but we do require an application form because it's tied to an OSAP application or tied to an application from another province. So if you're a student in BC who is wanting to come to the University of Waterloo to study, you'd apply to BC as your home province for financial aid, but you can still apply for University of Waterloo bursaries. The assessment for the bursary is based both on income from this for the student and income for the parents. So that's why we're taking a look at the information that's provided on the OSEP application or otherwise. It's important to note, and you want to get that, that distinction, we have an entrance bursary, which you apply for early so we can send it out with the offer of admission. But we also have bursaries that you can apply for when you're here in your first year and second, and third, and fourth. So try to take advantage of all of those opportunities. For international students, we do offer bursaries as well, but they are available to students in their second year and above. And that's based on the uh, requirements for the study permit and indicating that you've got enough and sufficient resources for at least your first year. So second year and above for any international bursaries. The OSAP program is what you want to take a look at. There is an estimator on the OSAP website. So if you were to go in, put in some information there, program, location, family income, things like that, you'll get an estimate back of how much they think you uh, would be entitled to. It's a mixture of loans and non-repayable grants. You do have the option as well to just take the grant money. So there is a, possibility, uh, there's a link on your OSAP application if that's what you choose to do no penalty, but the full amount of your OSAP funding is going to be used in any assessment of need, but you can work out from a budget perspective what you need. The loans are interest-free while you're a student. You don't make payments on those loans until six months after you have finished. The criteria for OSAP does change yearly, so take a look at it now, take a look at it in two years. Um, things may change, things may be different. Keep in mind, OSAP is very much where you're studying, are you living at home, away from home, what you're studying, what is the cost of that program, etc. How many in the family, how many kids, how many kids in university. So it's very hard, or college, very hard to have a cutoff or determine what that might be because it's all, there's, there's so many variables in it. So that's why I say don't discount it, do your research, see what you might be eligible for. If you live in another Canadian province, uh, then you would look at your home province's website. And we actually have all of those links listed on our page, most institutions do, that you can go and explore that particular information. The last slide I just want to provide is financing resources, and this is going to give you some websites to do some research, take a look. First one is ours, student awards and financial aid, filled with all kinds of information. The second is the University of Waterloo Future Students site, so that you can get information on scholarships and programs and things like that. 
There are a couple of scholarship um, and database areas, that's what Scholarships Canada and Wyconic is, to do some research on what scholarships may be available by a third party for my program or this particular school. Ontario University's Info does have a great list of scholarships as well. And I point to the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada because they have a lot of good resources on budgeting and preparing for high cost lifestyle moments, buying your, going to university or college, buying your first house, buying your first car. They have all kinds of details and information and help you start that budget. And that would be the one thing I would encourage you to do is really take a look at the costs, take a look at your resources, and keep in mind that this is like kind of a living budget. You've got to make adjustments all the way through. That's the end of my presentation today. Happy to take any questions at the end or in the hub. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Maureen. You know, it's funny. I'm pretty sure I could be wrong. I think it's the LCBO that you can collect aeroplan points. Um, if I would have known that in my undergrad, it actually would have been more helpful. Not that I go there often, but if I did, I maybe would have used that. Um, so thank you for those tidbits. So we're coming near to the end of our acronym here of places. The next one is about experiences, because like the keynote mentioned, and like so many of us have probably talked about, experiences in university, so much of it comes from outside that classroom. And so for that, Rather than listening to, you know, crusty old me the whole time, I want to bring up some students uh, that are literally living this experience. And we're going to have a bit of a student panel for you to get a feel of, like, what student life is like. So I am going to invite up our two students uh, ambassadors this evening. They're going to introduce themselves. Feel free to come up on stage. I'll grab your microphones. But I think just a way to shake it up, because we just talked about a lot of stuff and a lot of info, is to do one more this or that question. Just, you know liven it up, and I'm going to open it to our students then to answer afterwards. But the question is, would you rather, for the rest of your life, choose video games or board games? Video games, I've heard board games. All right. There you go. I didn't even like them that way. I just wanted to ask. Yeah. Um, I always find this one a little divisive, but nevertheless, I still think that's good. It's good to know there's still people out there that love board games. So come on up on stage. I'm going to grab you some stools, and I'll grab you your microphones. Yeah, come on this way. Perfect. So we have Abdullah and Elena here today. Oh, thank you. You go ahead. This is Carlos, everyone, and he's been really great helping us. So thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Yes, if that's all right. So before we start, I think it's only fair that you introduce yourselves, your program, et cetera, the year you're in. But then I think you also have to pick what would you have said, board games or video games. So we'll start first with Abdullah, please. Hi everyone, my name is Abdullah. I am in my fourth year of Health Science Co-op program. Um, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm very excited to be here sh and share my experiences with everyone. Thank you. Wait, board games or video games? Definitely video games. <laughs> oh, okay, decisive, I'm just seeing. Yeah, please take a seat. Awesome, and feel free to go ahead, Elena. Hi everyone, my name is Elena. I'm in my 4B term of mechatronics engineering here at the University of Waterloo. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I'm really excited to be speaking to you tonight. And I would pick board games. My family's big card players. Yes, I should have. That's a good point. Card games counts. Thank you so much for joining us on stage. Um, I think the best way to get started is to talk a little bit, like you've mentioned your programs, let's talk about what you do outside of your programs. So do you mind, say, mentioning some extracurriculars, sports, clubs, whatever? We'll start with you, Abdullah, and then we can go off to you, Elena. Um, definitely. I think I'm like one of those people who is like very involved in my own faculty. I'm part of Faculty of Health. 
Um, basically, every different opportunity that's offered by my faculty and part of it, I've done lots of mentorship for first year students who come to university and they need help with like their courses, stuff like that, and I'm like willing to answer their, their questions related to it. I've also been part of orientation. That's another aspect of mentorship where we plan many different events for first year students and we do it with them. Other than this, I'm part of our student-led community. That's like awesome, it's called awesome. Um, that's where we plan many different events for the students that are already part of Faculty of Health. Um, aside from that, I have also um, volunteered as an executive for many different clubs on campus. Um, MAPES is part of is an example of that. That is a student-run peer support program. So it's kind of like program offered to everyone in Waterloo. Um, if you ever feel like you want to talk to someone, something didn't go your way, an exam didn't go like it wasn't what you expected it to be and stuff, and you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed, you can offer a one-on-one -on -one call with the MAPES people, and they just do a one-on-one -on -one peer session with you and guide you to the correct resource that might help you to get over that uh, overwhelmness. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, so I've been involved in a lot of different things as well. So here at the University of Waterloo, we have what we call design teams, which are more technically focused clubs that um, oftentimes help students build their resume and build their careers and things. So I was a team lead for UW Robotics on campus. We do the Mars Rover team, if anybody's seen or heard of that. Um, it's pretty fun, you should check it out at some of the open houses and things. I've also been a part of UWAFT, which is our, one of our Formula Electric teams on campus. Um, and then outside of kind of the technical space, I've done a lot of things with our student societies. So I was the Vice President Communication and Vice President External for our Engineering Society, which is one of our student societies on campus. I was an orientation leader. Um, I've also run several different conferences and things on campus. So there's three different levels of engineering competitions within uh, Waterloo, Ontario, and Canada. And I was one of the chairs for the Canadian Engineering Competition and VP Technical for the Ontario Engineering Competition. I'm also a peer mentor for women in engineering and I do university ambassadors and tours on campus. Wow. You just made me realize I really didn't do that much in my undergrad, I guess. Anyway, but that's excellent. I'm so glad to hear about that. Um, I know we probably in the audience have some local people who might consider living at home, but for those who are considering residence, I'll point out it's a first year residence guarantee, so there's always a bed on campus. But um, would you, each of you, mind speaking, say, to your residence experiences? I know we chatted a little bit about it. Why don't we go to you, Elena, first? Yeah, for sure. So I lived in CMH in first year, which is Claudette Miller Hall. It's one of the traditional dorm style residences. Uh, I was in a single room in my first year. I was on the eighth floor, which is fun. Mm. Uh, it was a great experience. Um, I'm actually from the region. I'm from like KW region, but I still thought with a very rigorous schedule and the amount of hours that I was spending in class every day, it made sense for me to be on campus and to be going to clubs and things at night uh, so that I was able to kind of go back and forth and have uh, that liberty with that. Um, I also opted for the traditional style residence because I wasn't a great cook in high school. I didn't do a ton um, around the kitchen or um, just meal prepping in general. So having that meal plan was something that was really um, helpful for me to uh, make sure I was getting my food and make sure I was eating regularly. Awesome. Thank you. Abdullah, take it away. Okay, so I also lived in residence. I lived in Rev, also known as Ronick Village. It is a traditional style residence. What that means is I had a roommate. Uh, it was a very different experience. I was kind of like on my own in my own room back home, but now I had to share it with someone. But um, I became really, really good friends with my roommate. We used to play a lot of different games, uh, go to different events together that were happening on campus. So that was like a fun way. Other than this, I also lived on living learning communities, which is part of the residence. This is where basically you live with people who are either from the same program or from the same faculty. Um, that can help a lot with kind of like people meeting from the same program as well as from the same faculty. So through that, I was able to meet a lot of my friends that I'm still friends with, um, all of that kind of like goes to the, because of me living on residence. Uh, other than this, um, because as a first year, you are guaranteed a residence, but um, Waterloo also allows upper year students to live on campus as well. Like I never really had to live off campus. I always was one of those students to kind of like fill out my application for residence way early so that um, I'm, I'm offered a space on residence. Um, UW Place is a upper year residence, so that's where usually students from second year to above lives, and that's where I lived all of the other times. And one of the great sport 
support that's present for you on residence is your Don. Um, they are kind of like your uh, supervisors for the floor. So if there's anything that you need help with or something didn't go your way, you can always go to them. Um, I definitely utilized mine a lot um, in my first year. Yeah. That's awesome. I, um, I too lived in residence for a lot, also in my upper years. I also was a residence Don. I was the residence Don at the co-ed floor. Um, it was a little less support, um, a little more, you know. But it was an awesome experience, and it was really good for students, too, because I think you're right. You like building a friend network, which is, even if you know people coming into Waterloo, um, I think there's still that feeling that, like, what if I'm the only person and I don't know anyone? But news is, is that we all feel that way. Um, and I think that lends itself to a question that more students ask me than not, and I think it's important to talk about, like, through extracurriculars, through residence, and so on, like, how did you just go about, like, meeting people? How do you do it? Asking myself, too. Go ahead, Elena. Yeah, so um, one thing I like to point out whenever I do these kind of events is that I know Waterloo sometimes doesn't get the best rep for having a social life or having a lot of um, opportunities to meet people, but that's never personally been my experience. I've had an amazing time getting to know people, making connections and building friendships here on campus. One of the really cool things that we do in programs like mine, like in engineering, is we have the cohort system, which is where you're put in a group of students that you follow with you throughout your entire degree. So in all of my mandatory courses, I've had the same group of students in these courses. So I spend every day, all day with them doing lectures and things, and it's a really great way to make um, really tight connections, really great foundations for networking, uh, for housing and things later. Um, but they're really great supports that way. And it's nice because you get to know everybody. I know like my class is about 100 people right now and I know pretty much everybody in the class because we've been together for about five years. Uh, so that's a really great thing as uh, part of this program. Um, other things, of course, is getting involved in clubs. Um, throughout orientation, they really, really get you involved in meeting people in different faculties. They actually split you up into different uh, programs and things when you're meeting people in your first uh, orientation group. And then from there, they do things like club fairs, and they do things where you can come out and kind of informally get to know um, people on campus, get to know the opportunities. Um, even before you volunteer or get involved, you can come out and just participate in events and get to meet some of the other people that are involved in those events. Um, and I always found that very helpful. Thank you. I think Alina kind of like covered everything that I was gonna say. Um, <laughs> orientation definitely is a great way to meet people other than residents and where you live. Orientation, as I mentioned before, are kind of like events planned by upper year students for the first year students. And we, over one of the big goals is to kind of like encourage people to be out there, meet people who are from the same program, from the same faculty. So. Definitely orientation. Other than this, clubs. There are so many different clubs. We have, I think, over 200 clubs on campus. Um, yeah, and they are like a great way to meet a lot of people. Um, I personally had the opportunity to meet many people from different faculties that are not part of uh, Faculty of Health uh, through different clubs. Um, yeah, other than that, that's about it. That's awesome. Thank you. My last question, and then I'll let you be off stage because I know it can be. It's, there's literally lights directly on you. So um, for a lot of the students, say they're in grade 10, 11, 12, et cetera, they're looking at coming into university. So just in your experience, what was like the skill, say you learned in your first year, what was something, a piece of advice if you could give to this uh, class looking to come into university? Abdullah, why don't you go first? This is kind of like, like a, like a difficult question because mm -hmm. I think like the, the it's uh, uh, everyone is kind of like different, has their own personal needs and stuff like that. But I think one advice that I would say is like, don't be afraid to ask for help and be out there. Everyone in university, their goal is to make sure that you are successful in what, whatever you're doing, whether that be your professors, the TAs, uh, any other person that you interact with, they, they are there to help you. So I personally, when I was in first year, I used to be very scared of the professors. Um, as well as the teaching assistants. Uh, professors are also humans. They do uh, office hours. Their goal is to kind of like help you with any questions you have about the course. They are very, very, very passionate about the things that they teach and they would love to talk to you about. If there's a topic that you're interested in and you wanna know more about, but the course doesn't cover it, the professor definitely knows more. So mm -hmm. go have that casual conversation with the professor. Um, so yes, don't be afraid to ask for help and be open-minded. Uh, there are many, many, many different opportunities in university. You just have to be out there, willing to, you know, kind of like put yourself out there, 
look for these opportunities, and that's how I kind of like came to be a student ambassador. I didn't even know about it until I randomly was looking up online for ways to get involved in Waterloo University, and it popped up, and I applied, and I was like, I'm never getting it. And here I am today presenting it in front of everyone. Um, so yeah, be open mind and through university, you'll have opportunity to meet so many people from so many different perspectives, different opinions, uh, different backgrounds. So being open-minded is going to be very helpful. Love that. Take it away. Yeah, so I think one of the best pieces of advice I got before I started university was actually from my neighbor who is a, an engineering professor at the University of York, uh, or York University. Uh, and what he told me was pick a degree that you can get through, something that you're motivated to do, something you're passionate about, something that there's an end goal or something that you want to work towards, because that will keep you in the program. No matter what program you're in, no matter what school, there will be a moment, there will be moments where um, you'll be challenged, where it'll be hard, where it won't come easy, where you'll be frustrated and you'll have to work really hard to continue going with what you're doing and having something you're working towards, having a passion for what you're doing, having the why, as I mentioned earlier, that will keep you there and that will keep you motivated. Um, and really, you can do a lot of things with different degrees. You, your degree is what you make of it and your experiences are what you make of it. Um, I know my program is a really great example of that because it's, it's very broad in what you can do and a lot of people in my discipline go into different things like software engineering, computer engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, biomedical engineering, uh, but there really is no one right or wrong way to do things. It really comes down to what you're passionate about, what your experience is in, and what motivates you to continue doing uh, and continue your degree here. I love that. Both of you said it better than I ever could. So thank you so much. Thank you for your time on stage. Let's give them a round of applause because that's pretty brave. Thank you. Yeah. You can. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you can leave them. Perfect, thank you. So I, I will bring the students up again. Oh, see, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Carlos, God. So, just click ahead there. The last letter that I'm just gonna touch on briefly before we go into Q&A is supports because I think they actually did a really good segue for me that I didn't even have planned. One thing that I think students just have to think about is um, after you figure out what you want to do, where you're going to do it, how I get in, what's it going to cost, what kind of fun am I going to have? The next question that I think always should be paid a bit of attention to is what are the supports in place at that university I'm looking into? Not only is going to get me there in first year, but it's going to help me walk across the stage in graduation. Because I do think, contrary to popular belief, you're really not meant to have to do your undergrad alone. Like, there are supports always embedded. It's just a matter of finding them and being open to using them. So, for example, at different universities, they'll have different offices. We have what's called a student success office. There, they offer all kinds of programming. And it might be like academic skills related. So there's an essay writing clinic. I had to use that. There's a multiple choice test center workshop. But then there's also like professional development, leadership opportunities. I think it was awesome that Abdullah mentioned MATES. That's a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program. That's fantastic and it's really well used. But again, this is just something to consider that once you kind of figure out where you want to go, it's okay to ask like, okay, what help can I use when I get there? So something to think about. Now that's a quick recap here on slide of what we just talked about, places, that conversation card. When you are done here in the Q&A section and then so forth, if you wanna go back out into the Hagee Hall hub, which is where you would have come in, you can take this out there, you can go up to engineering and like list all this off if you want, or like I said, take it to another school. You can absolutely use this uh, tool beyond just Waterloo. But I think what we should do now is Q&A. Because you've probably been sitting here being like this presentation was really good, but you didn't address literally one thing I wanted you to when you were up here. So I apologize for that. But I want to bring up both Maureen, Andre, I want to bring up Elena, oh my God, I'm sorry, Elena, as well as Abdullah. Come on up. I'm going to pass a mic as well through the audience so I can get your question. Please take a seat. You can even kind of crouch on the stage if you want. Yeah. Please, yeah, if you want to use that mic, that's perfect. So, I'll just open it up generally. Does anyone have any questions at this point? It's hard to see with the lights. Perfect, I'm gonna bring you a microphone. Okay, I don't have a microphone. You say it to me, 
and all. Oh, see, sí. thank you, Carlos. Yay! Please. Okay, my question is about admissions. You said you take top six grades. I guess, like, that's all grade 12 grades? Your six grade, grade 12 courses? So, given that grade 12 would end in middle, late June, but the admissions have to be done by, you, you're answering by June 1st, so you have to have this, you're giving offers in, what grades are you really using? Just the first half of grade 12, really? So yeah, great question. So we actually use a mixture of grade 11 and grade 12 grades, and it's all about thresholds. So the more competitive the program, and the more layers we're assessing, the more we want more grade 12 information so that it's a fairer assessment. But we do look at students that are super strong in grade 11 and mix that with your grade 12 to calculate an average. So it's still the same required courses. So if we require calculus, we're gonna still look at your grade 11 math as well as your grade uh, 12. But in general, you have midterms and finals, whether you're in a term system or semester system. So all the universities in Ontario, and this is happening next week, we're getting a huge uh, influx of grades from the schools because we've hit another milestone. So once we have that new information, we do another round of admissions. And if you are above where our cutoff is at that time, you'll get an offer. If you're not there, and that could be not because you're not a strong enough student, it could just be you haven't taken any math courses yet. You're grade 12 math and you're applying to engineering, we wanna wait a little longer, you're automatically just gonna carry over to the next round. So we don't do first come, first served, it's our job in admissions to make sure whether you're the first person to apply or the last one, as long as you apply within the deadline and you submit all the required documents, everybody has a fair assessment and equal access to a spot. And if you get an offer, you have a spot waiting as long as you confirm. So we do four big rounds for, based on Ontario students. And then for out of province and international, I have an incredible team of 17 admission officers. Some are here tonight and answering questions. Uh, they assess all of those individually, again, doing those equivalencies, and we do those on a rolling basis. So our final round is actually at the very end of April, early May, and that's where we have at least a midterm for every grade 12 course. So that's, on average, about half of our offers are made in that final round, and again, a larger proportion in the more competitive programs. So kind of to answer your question, even though your courses are going on, we have, it's all about a snapshot in time. We actually get grades every day from schools, but we take a snapshot at specific times when there's a lot of grades coming in at the end of a term or midterm, and that's when we make decisions. And then you still have to keep working because you are still learning to prepare yourself for your first year courses, so your offer is gonna say you need to keep at least, for example, a 70 average in math and an 85 average overall, just as an example. So we will tell you exactly what our expectations are, and we will check your final grades when you are done just to make sure that you're set up for success. Thank you, awesome. Right there. Can I um, pass a mic back this way? Are people comfortable with that? Or do you want to yell it? I'll repeat it. If it's okay, Andre, I'm just gonna repeat Please. it for yeah. virtual. So the question was about beyond grades, that slide, and it's about extracurriculars and so on, if it's specific to programs or just in general for those tuning in online. So the good news is everything is on our website. We will tell you if we're looking beyond grades. In general, faculties of arts, environment, science, and health are predominantly, most programs, just the average is the main factor for admission. Engineering, Faculty of Math and Accounting and Financial Management are multi-layered. Um, so we do look at other things, which means we're assessing those other things and assigning a value to those. So that will be published. And what are we looking at? I will say um, we're continually evolving and modernizing what we're doing. So we want the most inclusive process possible. So our goal, we're actually revamping our supplementary form right now. And we wanna make sure that all of our questions are inclusive that they're based on research. So when we're scoring, it's not random. It follows a rubric. People are very well trained. It's consistent. We have multiple readers. So we want to have the best practices in place as a top tier university worldwide. And again, that could be anything from, so you always hear about extracurriculars, volunteering, 
um, and playing sports, but actually, it could be that you are working to help support your family. It could be that you're doing elder or childcare to support your family. So we recognize that experiences outside the classroom take many different forms. And so we want to ask those questions in those uh, situations where we're looking at that, give you a chance to share that. And again, we're looking at, is it the norm? Because most students are actually pretty similar, but there's outliers on both ends of the spectrum. So you have students that do the minimum 40 hours of volunteering, then I've seen students that have 2,000 hours. I've seen students who work almost full time, that means they don't have time for a lot of sports and other things. So we're looking at also, how much are you doing? How are you spending your time? Um, and again, by the time that you come in, it will look a little bit different than it does now. But again, I can say to you with confidence that again, it's gonna be uh, well advertised, we're gonna tell you what we're looking for, and we'll even have, like there's a silly video I did years ago right now that talks about the admission information form, so there'll be a, a better, newer version. Thank you. Does the high school AP program make that distinction for you? Is it better to have AP in a slightly lower grade or not AP in a slightly higher grade? The question for people online is referring to AP, so the question is, is it better to say B and AP courses have a slightly lower grade or vice versa? So Andre will speak to that, thank you. So maybe I'll start with a, a statement. All of our research indicates that if you're admitted, you belong here and you have an equal opportunity to be successful. So I'll give you a personal example. I live in Alora, small community. My kids are at, well, my youngest is at a school with 200 students. My daughter's in middle school. When they're done, they're gonna go to Fergus Public High School. And I'm the director of admission at one of the top universities in the world. My kids are going to the local high school, why? because it's actually about the environment that they're in, having good uh, family support, being capable students. So whether you're at a small rural school, an Ivy League private school, again, if you work hard and you earn those grades, we will take an accredited grade from an accredited school. So AP, IB is another one. I know there's lots of IB questions. The reality is if you're in an IB school or AP, you're probably all university bound. That's the norm that we see. But if you're at a school where only 30% of students go to university, it's not about how many students go to university, it's about the 30% that go to university, how do they do? And the answer is, if they've taken the right required courses, they're admitted, they do equally well. So it's a whole other journey that we heard about once you get to university, it's just getting through the gates. But if you've done AP, so to get back to your question, or IB, like higher level, sometimes those other systems cover first year material, and we'll say on our website the specifics, but we might give you credit in first year. But I will acknowledge again that the research indicates that students are still equal from an admission standpoint. So I will still take, if a, a school, school A says 89% and they're just a, a public school, small rural community, and an IB school says 89, they're both the same grade, if I said 89 for both. Um, so again, we treat them equally. Perfect, yeah, we'll take one more, please. Great question. So the question is about, say, hypothetically, you have four offers. And the question is about when do you actually have to say no to the other offers coming in for those online? If you want to answer, go for it. <laughs> I know you know the answer. <laughs> uh, Andre used to be my boss, so this is why. Um, so for in, Can or sorry, in Ontario, you have to let us know if you're coming by June 3rd this year. Usually it's June 1st, it's just when it falls. Um, but that's when you confirm to one school and basically lets all of the rest of us know, okay, they're not coming. The only caveat I'll say is, um, and Andre, then you can fill in the rest, is if you apply to schools outside of Ontario, like say you're here and you apply to University of British Columbia, they typically can have different dates. So they might say May 1st. So it's just depending, Ontario, we kind of have an agreement that usually June 1st or June 3rd is when we expect to hear from you, and if we don't, we don't expect that you're accepting unless you get a late offer. But for other schools in other provinces, especially even if you wanna to apply to any school in the States, just pay attention to their offer letters because likely they'll have a different date than this June deadline that we have, but please. And that speaks to when you heard me mention show ratios, or you might hear it mentioned as yield rates, we factor that in. There's so many factors. You, you don't know 
in this room, which university you're going to choose yet in many cases. So we know that you might not make that decision until the last moment. That's factored in. And our math actually works out pretty well. We're, we're pretty close to our 100% target uh, for enrollment each year. It's amazing, actually, when you think 70,000 applications and just shy of 7,000 students coming in. It's a bit of magic and a little bit of math, uh, but it all comes together. So we factor that in, but at the end of the day, as long as you confirm by the deadline, you've got a spot. Exactly. Well, I want to say thank you so much for coming on stage. Um, thank you, Andre. That was awesome. I'm going to let them uh, make their way into the hub while I just show you a couple last reminders. But then once this other slide is done, you can make a beeline to them and ask more questions if you'd like. Um, so thank you so much to my lovely co-hosts of this evening. Thank you. So. <laughs> Just the last slide I'm gonna mention here. One thing I should have mentioned too, this presentation is being recorded, so if you wanna come back to these questions that Andre just answered for you because you weren't quite clear or you didn't get it, or say you wanna pay attention to Maureen and the bursaries, absolutely, just, you can, you'll get a recording. It will be posted on our website, so just something to remember. Otherwise, I just wanna share quickly, when you're thinking about universities, what else you wanna do, these are some things to keep on your radar. Guidance counselors are fantastic. They often have years of experience in the field and they have an idea potentially of what might fit you for a school. But I'm also just gonna point out two other things because they're coming up as you go into grades 11 and 12. Often schools like Waterloo will bring in, um, say myself, I co say I go into Laurel, um, Laurel Heights, for example, as a high school. I'll come on behalf of Waterloo, I'll do a presentation, and you as grade 11 and 12s often get to come and visit me and ask questions. So as you start to figure out where you wanna go and what you wanna study, if possible, I recommend going to those high school visits, because we literally come to you, um, and this is where you get to pepper us with questions, but it's an opportunity for you to really feel it out. I'll also just point out one last time, if you have the opportunity, if you can go to the campus that you're looking into, I recommend it. Because one of the best ways to feel out if this school is for me, if I can picture myself living here for four to five years, is by setting foot on the campus and feeling if it feels right. Because you can absolutely kind of tell. So again, I'll just plug March Break Open House if you want to come back in a little bit. I'll be here, I'd be happy to see you again, but we'll also have like professors, students, etc. Again, they'd love to talk to you. Often our favorite parts of our job is actually talking to students, parents, supporters, just as yourselves. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming. I wanna say again, the hub will be open till 8.30, so if you wanna go ask questions, there's probably still cookies left, please do so. But otherwise, thank you so much for coming. Awesome.